once again. If there are any visitors here, please uh, leave a record of your attendance on one of those visitors' cards on the pew in front of you. And so our morning worship service is at 9 o'clock every Sunday morning. Uh, Bible study, 1015, and then Wednesday night, Bible study is at 7. In the way of announcements, please be sure you turn off your electronic devices. And there are several weak, uh, several sick on the list. Also, don't forget our Labor Day Youth Madness. It's just four weeks away, but they'll be going to Altitude Jump Park in Nashville. And the cost will be $35 per jumper, not per person, but per jumper. And go to your bulletin for more details about that. Also, tonight is our Sunday Night Eats following our evening services. This is for all the youth who are in high school and college. Also, visitation group number one will meet in room number one after services tonight. And if there are no other announcements, let's all stand and sing praises to God. Number 717. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented 
be seated. Our next song will be number 274, 274. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000. pray with me our Heavenly Father we are so very thankful for all the things you do for us we know that we are so extremely blessed you bless us with our food clothing and shelter and we know that all of these good blessings come from thee Heavenly Father we are so thankful that we have the privilege and it is a privilege that we have the opportunity to come to you in prayer and to speak with you talk with you and make known to you our wishes our desires and the things that we think we need but we know Heavenly Father that you know what we need and you know the true nature of man and that you will bless us in ways that we cannot understand and that you will always take care of us and give us the things that we absolutely need Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this congregation of thy people that meets here at Bobby Branch. We're thankful for the love, the fellowship that we have for one another, and we're thankful for the, uh, uh, in the community. We're thankful for the, the, the what, we, what we stand for in this community, that we stand for a true and a sound congregation. And we're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have this opportunity to serve you. Heavenly Father, please be with those who are sick and have lost loved ones. Please bless them and do the things for them. Help the people that minister to them to do the things for them that is most needful, that will make them comfortable, and that uh, they might, if it be your will, be back with us whenever they have an opportunity. We know, Heavenly Father, that sickness and death is a part of this life that you gave us. We pray that we would always look to you for understanding and guidance and wisdom to understand these hard times that we have in our life. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that Jesus came to this earth. He walked among men. He felt pain as men do. 
He was tempted as men are tempted, but he walked on this earth and never sinned. He was the perfect example for us. And he died on that cross that we might have the opportunity to spend the rest of our eternal life with you in heaven. Please continue to bless us and forgive us whenever we sin, for it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. For our imitation song, we'll use number 517, 517, and before our reading and lesson, We'll sing number 345, all four verses. <clears throat> when peace like a
reading tonight is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. For the past nine weeks, I've walked into the pulpit and said it is my honor to introduce to you the speaker. Well, tonight I have to say you're back to normal, and uh, I will do the best that I can, but let me tell you, we have had a remarkable summer series, and I mean, we just had some of the best speakers. Their lessons have all been prepared well, and it's been a great joy to in, be a part of the summer series that we've had this year. And Lord willing, we're looking forward to the one next year. And in fact, the elders will be working on that tomorrow night. So you can uh, go ahead and make your plans of what will be a part of next year's summer series. Generally, the first Sunday evening of the month, I address questions that have been submitted by the congregation. Sometimes I may have as many as 10 or 12 questions that are waiting in line. And I still have two or three, but... About six weeks ago, I went to Murray, Kentucky, and helped record a television program called A Bible Answer. And uh, I was assigned a number of questions, and after looking at those questions, I thought they would work well for our first one in the month of August. And so we're going to tonight address three different questions. And let me begin by pointing out interested Christians naturally have questions. There's questions that comes up in everybody's mind. I mean, you start mulling over, you're reading the scriptures, and you see a passage, and it just makes you want to ask questions. And the fact, the Bible encourages us to do that. Remember in Luke chapter 11, verse 9, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. The Lord wants us to be the kind of people who are not just sitting back, but are engaged and interested. And I think that's important for us. When we spend some time during our question and answers, it's not just ask a question, but we ought to be engaged ourselves to say, what does that mean? Is this consistent with what the Bible teaches? And sometimes we want to know what things mean when we hear a lesson from God's Word. In Acts 17 and verse 20, we read, For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. Sometimes we're sitting in the audience and perhaps we're the one who doesn't get it. We don't understand what it's saying. And I would appreciate follow-up questions. If someone says, I heard what you said, maybe I didn't understand you correctly, maybe I didn't need some more information, but if that's the case, feel free to do that. And sometimes we want to know what would God have us to do in a particular situation. This is what I refer to as practical questions, and our second question tonight will be one of those, one of those that requires us to do a little bit of thinking, a little bit of us, and to do some interesting search on that. The first question tonight is, which baptism is the one baptism mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5? Uh, Brother Cain read to us just a few moments ago that passage, but I want to put it back on the screen for you again because maybe now you'll understand the purpose of the question. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now, if you look carefully, you saw that there were seven ones there. And I will point out to you that when you come to the Bible, there are several baptisms. And it doesn't take long before you begin reading the gospel accounts that you find, first of all, the baptism of John. In Mark 1 and verse 4, Mark's record says, John came baptizing in the wilderness 
and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, we're going to address that a little bit more, but I want you to understand this was referred to as John's baptism. The second one we read about is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, where Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware of that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And look at verse 2. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. This is what's referred to as the baptism of Moses. And it describes when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea. They were immersed in the sense that they were under uh, where the water would have been even though the water was parted. And then there's the baptism of fire. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, we read, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, he goes on to explain in verse 12, his winnowing hand is in his fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And then there's the baptism of suffering, found in Luke chapter 12 and verse 50, where Jesus said, But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. What the Lord was talking about was his suffering that he was going to endure in the court and the trial and the beating and then ultimately the crucifixion on the cross. That was referred to as an immersion or a baptism of suffering. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was referred to earlier in Matthew chapter 3 verses 11 and 12, but we read about it specifically in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then finally, the baptism in water for the remission of sins that was in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter alluded to that in Acts 2 and verse 38 when he said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the questions I was asked, it's not a part of this one, but another question that I had to answer on the television program was, what does the word for mean in Acts 2 and verse 38? And it means in order to, and that's what we'll notice at some later point. But the question was, which Baptism is the one of Ephesians 4 and verse 5. And I would point out to you that there's only one of these baptisms that of the New Testament it, that is universal. All the others were limited either to a particular time like John's baptism or was limited to the number of people that it involved. For instance, while John's baptism was commanded, Luke 7 and verse 30, it was limited to the time of John's teaching. Now, we'll see that in Acts chapter 19. So, for just a moment, you read Luke chapter 7 and verse 30, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Him there is John the Baptist. That was God's plan that those people in that time of John were to be baptized. And they rejected God's will not doing that. However, and we'll be studying this in our Acts class on Sunday morning, when you come to Acts 19, Paul comes to the city of Ephesus. And we read beginning with verse 2, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much heard as where there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Now, if John's baptism would have been effective, Paul should have said then, good, everything is fine. But you continue reading in verse 4. 
Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. Now what I understand from this is John's baptism was effective while John was alive. However, after the church was established, after the Lord's baptism became effective, John's no longer was effective. And that's the reason why these men had to be, we would say, rebaptized. They were baptized a second time for the right baptism. That was the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus to be obedient to him to receive remission of sins. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit was also limited to the apostles and to the household of Cornelius. Not everybody was baptized with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, in the first century, there were people who were given miraculous gifts, but the baptism was something that was unique. I go back to verse 5 of Acts 1. He says, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And you go on, you read Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And suddenly there was a rushing mighty wind and filled the house, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. When you go to Acts 11, and Cornelius' house was receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it says, Peter recounts, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as upon us at the beginning. And then he remembered the word of the Lord, how that John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this event was rather unique. Not everybody received it. In fact, according to the scriptures, all we can see that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the apostles and the household of Cornelius. Outside of that, there's no record of it. So what we are left with then is water baptism was the only one that was for all nations, uh, for every creature. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or you go to Mark 16, verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So if you start looking, which is the one baptism of Ephesians chapter 4? Well, it's water baptism for the remission of sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I don't think that exhausts everything that's part of this passage. Because if you go to Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, you see that there are several ones, and while emphasizing their singularity, you know, the uniqueness of them, they also focus on unity. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, if you go back up to verse 3, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity, the, the singularity of the body. And then if you start going a little bit further, you go back to chapter 2 and look at verses 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace, and he has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Notice now, he takes Jew and he takes Gentile and he brings them together in one body. In fact, that's the way he begins those seven ones in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. But to even further confirm this idea, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by one spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Why does he keep saying one, 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 one? Is because he's emphasizing the fact that there's not a Jewish church and a Gentile church. There's not a master's church and a slave's church. 
There is one body, one church, and there's only one baptism that puts you into that. That, again, is the one baptism. I hope that answered the question. I was only given four minutes to answer that on the television program. So maybe you understand how tough that was. Second question. How do I know if someone is the one I should marry? That's a practical question. We have some young people here, and Brother Michael Clark addressed that subject to some degree a few weeks ago. He gave you a lot of statistics, and I think that was very good. But I want to begin with a little bit different approach. I want to point out choosing a spouse is one of the most important decisions you'll make in your life. It's far more important than what job you will do, what career, profession you choose to go into. That is important. It'll affect you for the rest of your life. But I will tell you, the spouse you choose is even far more important than that because it'll affect your happiness. Either your life will be a treasure or it will be a torment. Either you will go home and you will love being at home and you will love the people that are there or you will be living in sheer torment. Listen to the way Solomon puts it in Proverbs 12, verse 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. And you see, a wife, a wise woman, Solomon said, builds her house, but a woman, foolish woman, tears it down with her hands. Solomon talks about a, a, a contentious woman, and he talks about a harsh man, and I will tell you, who you choose to marry can choose whether or not your life will be happy or whether or not you'll be frustrated for the rest of your life. And let me encourage you, young people, think very carefully before you choose somebody to marry because you want your life to be happy. It can also affect your eternity. It can affect whether or not you'll be faithful to God and whether or not you get to go to heaven. Because if the spouse you choose works against you and pulls you away from the Lord, you're going to lose your soul. On the other hand, you may be um, fortunate enough to marry a good, godly spouse who will encourage you and prompt you to do even better. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 16. Paul writes, For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband. Now, how do you know, old husband, whether you will save your wife? He's talking about the person you have married. Do you not realize that perhaps some of the greatest influence in our life is on the person we choose to marry? And they can either bring out the best and can encourage the best, and that is being a faithful child of God. But I will tell you also that they can be a torment with regards to your spiritual life. Let me give you a couple of examples. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 4. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. Now, the writer of the book of Kings goes on to describe in vivid detail what all Solomon did because of these foreign wives that he had married. And I will tell you that if you marry a spouse whose interest is in worldly things, they are going to look to you and say, why do you have to go to church on Sunday morning? Why do you have to give to support the Lord's cause? Why are you so involved? I prefer that you go with me or do this with me and you will be torn between the two. And sometimes worldliness wins over. Or probably even a worse illustration is found in 1 Kings chapter 16. Kings of the north were bad guys. All of them were. Some of them stands out as even being worse than the others. And in chapter 16 and verse 31, it says, It came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing, for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Here's King Ahab. He was bad enough, but he married a woman who even made him worse. So 
Be wise in your choice because God intends your marriage to be for life. And I know a lot of people will come and say, but oh, my marriage is just a disaster. But you know, God wants you to choose that beforehand. In Romans 7 and verse 2, we read, For as the woman is the husband, is bound to the law, by law to the husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's free, least free from the law of her husband. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39, For a wife is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. You see, in God's eyes, marriage is for life. You marry the bad person, the wrong person, you're going to have a rough, rough life. That makes me think of what Brother Larry Acuff says all along. If you get married on puppy's love, you're going to have a dog's life. And that's, that's really true. And that's the reason why I said rough, rough, rough. Okay. Like anything in life, don't be dazzled by the superficial. Go for the substance. The superficial is what's on the outside. It's what people look at, and so often what attracts people, they say, oh, she's so beautiful. He's so handsome. He's got lots of money. She's got lots of class. But substance is what's important. You know, when you go to Proverbs chapter 31, there's a very, very wise observation made in verse 30. Solomon writes, charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. You know, one of the things that happens to all of us is age. And I almost get entertained, if you will, looking at my high school classmates on Facebook. I wonder, where did all these old people come from? And I'll tell you, people who used to have just, just wonderful beauty are now old and fat and ugly as far as they're outside. But you see, what Solomon tells us, though, is there's a character that's on the inside that is so much more important. And so I'd encourage you, don't go for the superficial, go for the substance. Find a person who is a good person who loves the Lord and wants to go to heaven and you choose them to be your spouse. Question number three. Should Christians be involved in astrology and reading their horoscopes? Now, let me point out to you that astrology is in the Bible and it is an ancient practice. It was primarily notable among the Babylonians. In fact, both Isaiah and Daniel speak about it. In Isaiah 47 and verse 13, listen carefully to what Isaiah says about Babylon. You are wearied in the multitude of your counselors. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. Here's the challenge that Isaiah presents before them. You're putting all your confidence, all your trust in these people who study the stars. And he says, if you think they're so great, let them save you. They're not going to save you. You're not going to find the plan of salvation in the daily horoscope or the monthly horoscopes or whatever zodiac sign they want to assign to you. Daniel let Nebuchadnezzar know when he interpreted his vision that it was not the stars that gave the interpretation or the revelation. In Daniel 2, 27 and 28, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Notice he said, you ask your astrologers, they can't answer that question. 
They don't know. The best way we'd say, they're making it up. In fact, they wanted the king to tell what the vision was and then they would give him some sort of interpretation. The king was wise enough to say, no, you've got to tell me what the vision was and its interpretation. And Daniel was able to do it because God provided that message. It's often associated with other mystical practices like divination. You go back to Deuteronomy 18 when Moses is giving the children of Israel the law prior to crossing over the Jordan River into the promised land. He's trying to prepare them to understand you're going to confront a lot of this paganism. And when you do, here's what God wants you to do. He said, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes a son or daughter pass through the fire, one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, one who conjures spells or a medium or spiritist, one who calls upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. These nations which you dispossessed listened to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Now, folks, that's very important. He's saying... You don't listen to them. In fact, I not only only want you to listen to them, he said, anybody who does is an abomination to me. Now, anybody who has read a horoscope in a newspaper or a magazine or has listened to one of these prognosticators knows that at the best they have educated guesses. Some of them in their predictions try to look and say, well, it's the month of August. It's going to be hot outside. Well, I I guess that's probably a, a pretty good educated guess. But many of them are at worst pure deception. Don't you find it interesting that all of these prognosticators always tell what good's going to happen to you? They're always wanting to appeal to your vanity. Christians shouldn't have anything to do with it. That belongs to the worldly side, to the pagan side, to the ungodly, to the demonic side. Jeremiah 10 and verse 2, Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the Gentiles are dismayed by them. I don't need to look up to the stars to try to find meaning in life. Those stars are not going to tell me whether or not I ought to do this or that. There's no direction in it. And then a passage which I think is perhaps the best of all of them in answering this is found in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living to the law and to the testimony? If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What is Isaiah saying? You don't go to them, you go to God. And I would tell you, instead of spending time reading a horoscope, read your Bible. Because there you're going to find what God says. You're not going to find it in a horoscope. And what you will find if you read your Bible is you were made in the image of God. You will find that God has a plan for you. He wants you to be saved. In fact, he gave his son to die on the cross for you. And he's given you instructions of how to live in order that you enjoy that eternal home in heaven. See, practical questions arise all the time about how a person should live. And the challenge is to find the right passage in the Bible that addresses that and then apply it to our lives. And that's the reason why we ask these questions, not just to to fill a Sunday night lesson, but to find some application that will help us do what God wants us to do. And yet I come back all the time to some of the most basic questions. And I think about Paul on the road going to Damascus. 
And I think about how that light shone about him and how Paul recognizes that he has been persecuting the Lord and his question is, Lord, what do you want me to do? I think every one of us need to ask that question. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll tell you what he wants. If you're not a Christian, the Lord wants you to be obedient to the gospel. He wants you to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He wants you to repent of your sins. He wants you to confess his name before men. He wants you to be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what the Lord wants you to do because he sent Paul on into the city and Ananias came to him and told him what he needed to do. What does the Lord want me to do if I am a foot-dragging Christian? If I'm a Christian who is just involved in the ways of the world and I've let myself be pulled away, I can tell you what the Lord wants you to do. Exactly what the father of the prodigal son did. He's looking and he's waiting for you to decide on your own it's time to come home because there's where the blessings are. We're going to sing the song, Oh, Why Not Tonight? And if you need to respond, would you come as we stand and sing? Oh, do not let the word
Good evening. On behalf of the elders, we want to thank you for being with us for our evening worship service here at Bobby Branch Church of Christ. Um, I did have a couple of sick that we failed to get in the list. I uh, also want to keep in mind Brother Ken Martin and also Sister Susie Griffith. Uh, but we failed to get those to the list to, to, to Ricky for the announcements tonight. So, If you are with us and you were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, the communion has been left prepared. If you will proceed at this time to the back of the auditorium and go to the door immediately on your left, there will be men there that will help you uh, partake of the Lord's Supper and complete your worship service. So, Once again, thank you for uh, being with us. And Tony, thank you for the lesson. There he is. <laughs> uh, it's glad to have you back in the pulpit on Sunday nights and glad to see. I, I, I'll speak for myself, but I think others too. I enjoy question and answer. Uh, I enjoy uh, the, the questions that are posed by the uh, congregation here and uh, trying to address those and working to address those from God's word. So, and again, Caleb, thank you for the song selection and, and leading us in those songs. So one other uh, thing that I omitted this morning, I was commenting to this morning on the uh, different events that we have coming up as we go into August, and September, and October. And Sister Iona King was gracious enough to remind me I missed one. And that is the uh, singing at the Antioch Church Building during the week of the Warren County a &L Fair. So let's, that's certainly one that's enjoyable by all. I think most of the time we pack that building full and some of us are standing outside singing if we get there too late. So I want to remind everyone of that. We have lots of opportunities for adults and young people, for edification and for fellowship together. So let's try to all take advantage of those and participate in those as much as that we can. We'll have one more hymn and a closing prayer. It may be in the thankful once again for the day of life. We're thankful that you love us and you care for us. We're thankful that we live in a country where we can assemble to worship. And we're thankful that we had the opportunity to do so tonight. We're thankful for those who chose to come and to worship with us. Father, we pray that you will be with us, that we will take the things that we have heard this day, that you will help us to apply them to our life and share them with others. Be with us through this week. May we be guarded by you. May we make wise decisions and may we represent the Christian life such that others will understand that they too can have this hope that we share. Be with us as we depart for this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> 